Sure, Sandy. I'm Sandy Miswitz, Executive Director of CDTC. Steve Feeney, Stephanie County. Mark Castiglione, CERPC. On the wire, Tom Conley. Joe. Joe Pulis, Correctional County. Andrew Kraschik, City of Troy. Liz Cornos, Village of Boston Spa. Randy Milano, City of Albany. Uh, Bob Rice, New York DOT. Uh, Greg Richard, New York DOT. Mm -hmm. Tom Richardson, City Mechanical. Jacob Neiman, CDTC. And Miguelski County Street. Hi. Um, on our online community, listening in virtually, I'll just read the uh, names as I see them. We have Jen Saponis from CDTC, Andrew Tracy from CDTC, Kara Sherman. Um, I'm not sure who you're affiliated with, so please put that in the chat if you don't mind. Uh, Carrie Ward from CDTC, Chris Wallen, City of Schenectady, Chris Bauer, CDTC, Jamie O'Neill, Tom of Malta. Jeff Pimer, Create Manning Engineering, Joe Lasavita, City of Waterloo, Joe Semino, CHA, Joe Seaman Graves, City of Cohoes, John Scavo, Tana Clifford Park, Kelly Kircher, DOT. Thank you. Nice stop. Melissa Shanley, CDTA, Patrick Jordan, uh, Albany Port District Commission, Paul Sheldon, Schenectady County, Rima Shamia, CDTC. Ross Merrill, CDTA, Ryan Riper, Town of Wilton, Teresa LaSalle, CDTC, and Bill Anslow from Albany County. Did I miss anyone? And Kara is a planner for the Town of Malta. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. So, introductions, visitor issues, item two on our agenda. Are there any visitors wishing to address the Board of the Planning Committee at this time? One once, one twice. We move to our first administrative adoption of prior meeting minutes of January 12th, which were distributed uh, hard copy and online. Um, I need a motion to adopt the meeting minutes of January 12th, please. I move that the uh, corrections are removed the extra space between paragraph two and three on page three. The correction is remove the extra space between paragraph two and three on page three. Wow. <laughs> wow. And I thought Mike Valentine was our. Uh, I, had, I had pulled person. it over the past uh, few weeks. I've had some extra time to look. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And a second, please. I'll second. David Milano. Thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any remaining or opposed to adopt our minutes? Item 3B is the Transportation Improvement Program Fiscal Constraint Summary Table 4 update. This is a running story every meeting, but we'll look at the update with the latest version of our four year balance program, five year balance program. Correct. As I'm pulling this up, I'll ask uh, Jacob to introduce it and I'll display it on the screen in just a moment. Yep. Um, so the table shown here and in the packet, this incorporates um, all the amendments and project selection changes that we've made over the past month uh, from the current tip up to date. Um, even with all those changes, we are still um, under program 4% in this federal fiscal year and 5% total. So we are within our federal high level guidelines. So let's do that for report. For the report, Jacob. Any discussion on the constraint um, update? This, is, voting item, this um, is just information, it's not a voting item. Thank you. Are there any correspondence from the Federal Highway Administration to report um, the board? Not on fiscal constraint. Yet. Okay. Next item four moves us into the voting action items for the tip amendments. First up is I may 2019 to 24. Uh, item one is uh, 594 State Pen 1761.64 Lark Street, Madison Avenue, Washington Avenue, and the Film Phil uh, Rehab. And Randy will give us the executive summary. Randy, yeah, we had a scope change on this when it was originally programmed, it was more of a preservation of mill and fill. Uh, we're taking more of a complete streets approach, and as such, uh, the pre scope additional design cost. Uh, is $89,000, and we'll be covering that with the local chair. Okay, good. Any uh, discussion or questions for Randy on this? It's not a uh, fiscal constraint increase, no offset. Yes. Are you ready to vote? Are you comfortable voting on this? Uh, move it. 
clarification. Thank you, Steve. Maybe a second. Second by Marcus de Leon. All in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any abstaining or opposed? Go once, twice. Item 4A1, Albany is hereby adopted. Thank you. Item 2 is Schenectady 247, State 10-1760.57, Brandywine Avenue, Interstate 890 to State Street, safety improvements in the city, uh, county, and Chris Wallen is, he on is virtual today. online. Hi, Chris. Good morning. Good morning. Executive overview of this. Uh, so this is the uh, the city's Brandywine Avenue safety project. It was awarded in the uh, competitive HSIP solicitation. What happened happened back in 2016. Um, we've had delays on the project, but we are ready to go. We have PSE. We have a assumed letting date of in a couple of weeks, actually. And when we were going through all of our PSE and estimates, we did have a um, discrepancy in the estimate between what was on the tip and what we had. Um, the city spoke with the DOT about this uh, as it's HSIP funding, um, and usually a little bit different uh, given that it's a safety funding. And the, the DOT in conversations with uh, Bob's office informed me that there was HSIP money uh, available to use on this. However, given the amount, um, the DOT, I needed to come to the table to, uh, to get a TIP amendment for it. Um, the project uh, really hasn't changed any type of uh, scope. It is still a safety project, uh, essentially a pavement preservation with a focus on the Albany Brandywine intersection, uh, which is where we had a fatality years ago. Uh, we're going to be doing some, uh, I believe, raised intersection and improvements in that, uh, upgrading the signals and striping. Uh, and then the project, I believe, uh, would be an increase of costs of, of $400,000. Um, it, it's percentage wise a lot, but in actuality, not very much considering uh, all the estimates when the project was put on the tip were done in 2015 or early 2016. And now we're into 2022 with uh, real dollars and uh, COVID uh, inflation. So um, I, I also, I know that Greg, if you wanted to touch on uh, the HSIP portion of that, because that's a little unique. Yeah, you know, uh, HSIP is our hardest to spend fund source and as a as a region and a state, we almost never spend it all. So uh, a project with a justifiable scope and a good use of safety money is uh, always a good idea to program HSIP funds when available and they are seemingly always available. So uh, it's a good, good use of safety funds. So That, that's that's why we're, I'm, I'm coming for you with uh, the use of the funds is because of the, the usual uh, what, what Greg and Greg and Bob and Lorenzo talked to me about was that there usually is uh, a surplus of HSIP funds because of how hard it is to actually spend the money given the high requirements to use it. So. Okay. I mean, this funding does not compete against anything else. At, at the table. So it's either regional or even statewide. Funds, depending on how it balances out. Uh, traditionally, particularly downstate, the Hudson Valley and the city have a much harder time spending these funds. So. And since it's up on screen for our new members, when you see fund sources listed as safe NY or something with an NY after it, that indicates it's a statewide fund source for lack of a simplest way of portraying it, uh, which distinguishes what's competitive here at the CBTC table. Chris, thank you, Sandy. Any energy efficiency components, Chris? You're going all LED on your your signals. Is there lighting included or any? any uh, well, the, the lighting the lighting is LED. The signals, uh, I believe, will be LED. Um, otherwise, I mean, I, I think this will be the first raised intersection in the city, and uh, we're already looking at a second location um, to try to uh, bring down, you know, uh, or or actually raise up the pedestrian awareness. If anybody's been on this corridor. This is, uh, with the exception of the 400 block of downtown, the busiest pedestrian corridor in the city of Schenectady. Um, and it is busy from 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. the next day. There's a, a constant amount of people uh, in this two block area. Um, and, and that was why the project and Rob Lamoge and everyone when it was awarded, uh, it, it scored so well is because it was this little known, little forgotten about area. And uh, when people actually came out and did 
pedestrian counts. I think the the numbers were eye opening about what actually and how much uh, pedestrians and commerce and, and and goes on in this little this little area of uh, Brandywine Avenue. Report. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions or discussion before we vote? None. That motion by CP. <coughs> Second by Andrew Kreshek. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. So that was item 4A2. Moving to 4B is the Unified Planning Work Program. Solicitation recommendations by Sandy. Thanks, Steve. And I think I'm going to combine B and C together because they do kind of overlap. Um, I do have a presentation that I wanted to walk you through. Uh, to discuss our unified planning work program for this year. Um, first off, I wanted to say, you know, uh, I apologize for us not being able to present this at the January meeting. Um, our January agenda was so dense that <laughs> it would have, uh, we would have been here for about seven hours, I think. Um, but we, um, we've done a lot of work over this last uh, month or two uh, to generate our work plan for this year. It's really a wholesale redo of um, the work program of what you know, longtime members have seen in the past. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure is cooperating here. Multitasking sometimes doesn't work really well. Um, Okay, you should be seeing the presentation now on screen. Um, so I have a presentation to kind of walk through the draft uh, document um, in the packet that was mailed to you and also available on the planning committee webpage is the full text as well as the uh, budget tables. Um, so there is no way I can go through the 70 pages in 15 minutes and do it justice, but I, I wanted to give folks the highlights of what the UPWP is, why we do it, and, and sort of what's in it for this year. Um, so as a reminder, particularly for any new members uh, and anyone listening, uh, the CDTC as a metropolitan planning organization has three core functions, developing a regional long-range transportation plan, also called the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. For us, that's New Visions 2050. The second component is the Transportation Improvement Program, which is a five-year capital program of projects. That's the tip. That's what uh, we're updating uh, right now. And then the third component is the UPWP, which is a one or two year work plan that contains all of CDTC's planning activities and task budgets that are federally funded. There's some other resources that go into that from the state and other um, sort of non-US DOT fund sources as well as local funds. Um, but that is what is before you today uh, to review, and we're going to uh, open up public comment period uh, with your approval uh, following today's meeting. So the UPWP uh, includes a list of tasks. Our, we were operate the UPWP in our office on the state fiscal year, April 1st to March 31st. Um, the, each task in the UPWP identifies, you know, by the description, uh, who's going to do the work, whether it be staff, consultant, others, um, the timeframes, how much it's going to cost us, and what all the fund sources are. And, and it's it's federally required uh, to include all those elements in, in federal statute. Um, and this is, again, a document that we use to program the Federal Highway Administration and the FTA planning funds that come to us from the US DOT. Um, so, the development process that we used was very uh, condensed. You know, I obviously was hired in August. So, you know, given the change in leadership here, we didn't have time to start this as early as we would have liked, but we brought to our policy board in September, the idea of issuing a solicitation a call for projects um, that consolidated a couple of our um, application processes that normally go on in a, in a given period of time, we've heard the concern about being, you know, kind of burnt out from filling out applications. So we thought we would do linkage, some amount of our technical assistance program, and definitely some amount of our regional planning initiatives all in one solicitation. Um, so that was issued, um, approved by this body in October. We issued it right not long thereafter. We had a workshop in mid-October, and we have proposals due on November 24th. 
And what we had in the solicitation, um, a couple of key requirements, obviously at the time we didn't have an infrastructure bill. So we said that, you know, the projects had to meet the eligibility of what was in the FAST Act. Um, and they absolutely needed to, you know, further the goals and policies of our new visions plan, because that's really the essence. New visions provides the policy framework for how CDTC operates. The TIP provides the capital fund funds to implement and the UPWP provides uh, the opportunity to further refine planning concepts um, that need further development that were identified in the long range plan. So that's sort of the general relationship of the three documents. In the solicitation, we again had three project categories, as I mentioned, the linkage program. Uh, we reserved $200,000 as we often do to support the linkage program. Um, we had regional plan implementation and then again, a, a technical assistance uh, program. And these were the proposals that uh, were submitted to us. We received six proposals. Um, the first one is from the town of Kuzik. Um, it was really intended to take um, some road uh, condition data, some pavement condition data, and translate it into some kind of an asset management plan for the town. Um, so then we viewed that as a regional plan implementation test uh, in support of infrastructure planning here. Uh, the other five proposals were all related to our linkage program. We had the City of Schenectady's Albany Crane Street Center Study, Church Street Corridor, Complete Streets Corridor, and um, apparently the slides are not changing in Zoom. Yeah, Sandy, there it's just um, it's not a slideshow. Yes, it's not. So we see this. We see the screen um, with the, all of the slides on the left hand side, but we don't see it as a full screen. I see it up on our board. Maybe unshare, click screen share, and then you're going to look for the uh, screen that shows just the single slide and share that screen. Okay, try that. How about now, Jen? Yes, um, although I do see the next slide on the right-hand side, but this is better than previously. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Um, technology is great when it works well. <laughs> Swap out, let me get rid of this uh, presenter view. Sorry about that, folks, hold on. Okay, how's that, Jen? No, no, I don't see any of it. I think presenter view may be that, there. That, that, yep, yeah. perfect. Okay. <coughs> Let me go back just real quick, um, just so that the audience can see the slides. And I would encourage you to watch the video <laughs> because some of the things. So we talked about the long range plan, the TIP and EPWP and what those are. Uh, just some description of the uh, what's in the UPWP. Uh, we started the discussion on the development process. Uh, talked about the solicitation approach. And I think we were here reviewing the project proposals. Um, so I think I left off with five project proposals for the linkage program, Albany um, and Crane Streets linkage study, the Church Streets Complete Streets Corridor study, the Exit 16 linkage study in the town of Wilton, um, Kuzik Road, which is Route 7 in the towns of, town of Brunswick, um, and Sand Creek Road Complete Streets feasibility study in the town and village of Colony, led by the village of Colony. Um, so all of those project ideas um, requested uh, a total of federal funds in the amount of $370,000. Um, so in December, um, and all I should say, we, we uh, well, I'll get to it, I'm sorry. Um, in December of 2021, um, NYSDOT issued um, the UPWP guidance document as well as our funding allocation estimates. And this did include the bipartisan infrastructure law funding levels. So um, what you're seeing on your screen in the table represents um, 
the increase that you're that we received between 20 fiscal year 2021 2022 versus 2022 2023 the upcoming year um, as you can see the federal highway administration planning funds uh, went up for us almost by 36 percent um, the FTA side of our planning funds went up slightly um, you know pretty negligibly negligibly honestly but the big increase for us was on the federal highway side uh, that's directly as a result of the infrastructure bill. Um, the, as I said, the six project proposals were reviewed by the staff and uh, the, there's a summary document in your packet that gets into more detail on this, but just in terms of the highlights, um, I'm showing you our evaluation results uh, with ranked, we ranked everything one to five based on the established criteria in the solicitation material, one being the highest. Um, and so we are recommending four projects for funding. Uh, the Hoosick Roads uh, infrastructure project we thought was a, a very interesting one given all of the concerns on pavement condition and we could probably learn some things about asset management. Uh, the Crane Street, Albany Street linkage study was ranked number two. Um, the Sand Creek Road complete streets feasibility was number three. And then the uh, Town of Brunswick's Route 7 study was number four. Um, so it actually works out that the linkage federal share is exactly $200,000. Um, so that fits into that reserve that we uh, set aside. And then the town of Hoosick's project would be an additional $30,000. So what we would like to say is the other proposals were good, um, but you know perhaps they could consider applying next year or um, maybe scaling back their proposals to request some technical assistance through our uh, rolling technical assistance program that we'll have uh, throughout the up upcoming year. Um, I'll stop there and ask if there's any questions about the evaluation of these projects or how that process worked. Okay, so given that, um, we then went forward to build the UPWP um, and in January, we spent a lot of time working on developing this new document. The key thing that is required in building UPWP is connecting everything to the federal planning factors, our new visions planning factors, and some additional uh, federally required federal requirements. Um, this bullet list sort of generally summarizes the planning factors in statute that we have to address in our UPWP. As you can see, they all align with our long range plan principles and uh, priorities. Um, and there's a range of things. It's not just infrastructure. It's not just economic uh, development. It's not just bike and pet. There's a whole range of things that we need to consider as part of the planning process because it's a system. It's not just one thing in isolation or something else. Um, in addition to the planning factors in statute, the FHWA and the FTA in the very end of December issued new planning emphasis areas that we need to at least acknowledge in the UPWP. Um, a lot of these are already in our work plan and are part of our standard practices here. Um, there's a few like coordinating with the US Department of Defense and the Federal Land Management Agency that are going to be new for us. Um, but they're required and we'll have to figure out how to make that work. And for our context in this region, that's really facilities like the Waterbury Arsenal, um, the Kessel Ring site up in the town of Milton, uh, the Navy Training Center, and then the, um, the Saratoga National Historic Park. Uh, so that gives you a sense of the types of facilities we're talking about in terms of this coordination. Um, Division of Military Naval Affairs over here too. There's probably more, yeah, and that's why there's uh, there's some there's some guidance coming in terms of what facilities are going to qualify because there's all sorts of military facilities, that's obviously. Right. Thank you. Um, and then of course we have the bipartisan infrastructure law requirements, which at least one of which is all MPOs are now required to spend 2.5 percent of their planning funds or FHWA PL basically on complete streets planning. Uh, this MPO we've been doing that as standard practice for a long time now. Um, so we'll have no problem meeting that requirement, but that's a new requirement that we will have to address in this UPWP and have. Um, so some of the other sources of information in terms of how we 
um, compile the work plan is, you know, we hear, uh, we have a number of advisory committees here, as you know, and we get input from them um, for community meetings, um, even on planning projects. So we consider all of the things that we're hearing from the public, as well as our advisory committee meetings. Um, we consider recommendations in our regional planning documents, such as our local road safety action plan, our trails plan, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously needs that have emerged in conversation with all of our partners here at the table and even outside of the table. So all of these things come together to formulate the, uh, to form the UPWP. So where we're at today, um, as of this meeting, um, we have the draft 2022-2023 UPWP to um, review um, and open a public comment period. Um, we're approving the addition of new projects from the UPWP solicitation. And um, hopefully we'll again approve this document for release to the public. We do have a virtual public workshop scheduled for um, Wednesday, February 16th. So we'll have an opportunity for the public to kind of be briefed much like I am today on the UPWP. Um, and the comment period is going to last until the day before the policy board on March 2nd. Um, it's tight, um, but the calendar of the month of February is not our friend with 28 days, <laughs> but we'll do the best we can. Um, any questions about the development of the UPWP before I move on to like what's actually in it? Okay. Um, so let's talk about what's really in it. Um, I organized this, um, if you've seen our UPWP before, um, there are these categories that are established by the FTA actually um, for their needs. Um, so it helps us organize the tasks in a way that kind of has some logic to them. So this first group of tasks are sort of just basic administration of the MPO and some of our planning programs, like the, the, how we administer the linkage program or the work I do with uh, CDRPC to identify projects for our technical assistance program. Um, just basic operations of the MPO. There's also federally required pieces in here, such as our environmental justice Title VI requirements. Um, and we also, as an aside, manage um, the contract of our statewide association for metropolitan planning organizations. So we have that administrative work in here as well. Um, and the biggest chunk of the pie, aside from the administration of the NYSAMPO staff consultant is our public participation. Um, that has really ramped up over the years. We're hiring and he's about to start in mid-February, a public participation specialist. Um, so you'll see more and more evolution here of our public participation tools, our graphics, um, moving kind of from analog to digital, <laughs> if you will. Um, and you'll continue to see a lot of investment in public participation. The details of all of these, of course, are in the draft document. As I said on the website, I couldn't possibly do this all justice in this conversation, but I do encourage you to read the UPWP, go through the line item task. It's uh, organized very um, simply, so you can kind of cut to the chase on what the goal of each one is and sort of the steps and tasks that we're planning on taking. Um, and then of course the budget is there as well. This next category is sort of um, what I'll call our, our, our data oriented tasks. Um, these involve things like collecting transportation data, um, utilizing census data, and managing the Capital District uh, Regional Indicators webpage that CDRPC uh, manages, our internal geographic information systems, and then our pavement condition inventories. I'll point out that we have a new inventory that we're investing in this year, which is for the city of Schenectady. Uh, we do a windshield survey uh, using our staff. Um, so we will um, be doing that uh, project on behalf of the city of Schenectady. We have an ongoing relationship with Albany County. Uh, we do an annual, uh, I believe it's an annual survey of Albany County roads as well. The next category, the next two categories are actually long range transportation planning categories. This is the system level. So think about things that um, affect the region as a whole. Uh, for the long term. That's why this category includes things like our regional travel demand model, also known as the step model, um, 
which is our traffic forecasting um, tool. And um, the maintenance of that in, is, is in this category. We also have our new visions plan in this category. Um, the ongoing uh, review of our performance-based planning, all of our performance measures, infrastructure planning, climate change initiative, which is a new initiative for CDTC that will hopefully be getting more into um, evaluating and documenting the share of greenhouse gas emissions that transportation contributes um, to the region and looking for strategies and actions to, to, to you know, work on reducing that impact. Um, and we had included the town of Kuzik's asset management plan in this category. The next group um, under the long range planning is the project level. Um, project level, it's kind of a vague term, but in our thing, line of thinking, this is more the operations of the transportation system. So this is where uh, we update our congestion management uh, process, which we do plan on doing this year. Um, dealing with our regional PIM committee that was created through New York State DOT Region 1. Um, we have a regional signal timing program that we've been sitting on because of COVID. Um, it just wasn't the time to roll it out when traffic was not behaving the same way that it was pre-COVID. Um, I think we're at a point where we're collecting some traffic volume data and seeing what the quote new normal is. We may not be at the new normal yet. Um, but I think we're in a position to initiate the consultant piece of this regional signal timing pro program this year. So that uh, this section covers those sorts of activities. This next group is what's called the short range transportation planning. Um, so these are sort of our, many of which are ongoing sort of on demand sorts of activities that uh, involve a lot of our advisory committees. Um, ranging you know, from complete streets work, freight planning, <coughs> smart communities. A new one for us this year is health impact assessments. Uh, we're partnering with the CDRPC to take a look at how transportation and public health and what that relationship is. Um, we're changing the, the tone of the capital coexist program, which in the past has been uh, to distribute funds to support sort of educational programs. Uh, we still are maintaining some of that, but we're adding a new element to that, which is reserving some funding for demonstration projects related to linkage studies or other activities. So we're hoping that that funding will help support some, initial, some additional uh, demonstration project work um, in the region. Um, ADA planning relates to the uh, transition plan work that we assist all local governments on. There's some consultant assistance within that. Um, to do some data collection uh, related to ADA facilities and communities. Um, and we have revamped our, and plan on uh, revamping a little bit, our bike ped planning program, and we're renaming it the Active Transportation Planning Program. Um, it's a more holistic term because it's more than just bicycles and pedestrians now. Um, there's other modes that are um, innovative that can be part of that conversation. Uh, so we're, we're going to be revamping that. We're going to be changing the tone a little bit of our bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee um, and hopefully, you know, having that group um, expand some of the topic areas um, that they're involved with. And most notably, the Complete Streets Advisory Committee is going to be folded into that group. Uh, some of the Complete Streets Advisory Committee work, which might have been done um, because of the sensitivity of subject matter, there could just still be a subcommittee to that to allow any sensitive conversations, but these are all things that we're going to work through over this next year um, to evolve. Um, and we continue our support of the Clean Communities Program, that is a, actually a United States Department of Energy program. Uh, for which we receive funds to promote alternative uh, fuel vehicles in the region. And there's a lot of work done on uh, EV infrastructure, EV planning. We do events throughout the region. So, you know, we're, we're continuing our support of that uh, program for which we receive USDOE funding uh, in addition to RPL and our other uh, federal resources. Next two groups, um, the Transportation Improvement Program section kind of goes without saying, this is where we're gonna have our TIP committee. This is where we're going to debrief on our TIP update process and all things TIP, come up with some new ideas, um, refresh what we've been doing. I expect that TIP committee to be an ongoing committee, probably uh, comprised of folks in this room um, and some folks listening online. 
Um, air quality conforming is just a block that we put in here to address our federal requirements related to the Clean Air Act um, and the Transportation Improvement Program. Um, we have travel demand modeling services and TIP project development support. These two categories really are intended to um, use our regional travel demand model for whether it be state project development or local project development. It could even be used for, hey, I have a uh, 300 housing unit complex coming to my community. What's the traffic impact growth rate, background growth rate, these sorts of things. And that, that's the work that the model can do there. The planning emphasis areas um, are just, uh, again, this is sort of FTA language that we have to put in here. Uh, but this all relates to human service agency transportation. That's where our coordinated um, human services transportation plan lives. Our transit planning work with CBTA, including the bus lane feasibility study we have going on. Our transportation demand management initiatives, which um, we hope to do more of that work um, to reduce the single occupancy vehicle use in the region over time or safety planning, and then um, we've expanded the definition of security planning to include the resilience. Um, and that's where we'll get into vulnerable infrastructure to flooding um, and how to harden our infrastructure to address some of those things. And then this final group is our, what I'll call a lot of it is our consultant-led linkage planning work. Um, we have basically one, two, three, four, five, plus seven linkage studies. Um, the Town of Colony GEIS support and the Town of Malta GEIS support, um, we have agreements with the Towns of Colony and Malta to review development proposals under their generic environmental impact statements and uh, basically assess the traffic impact of new development. Um, so we have those agreements. And then the Shared Transit Service Planning and Analytics Initiative is an initiative that we're a contract we're managing on behalf of the statewide uh, association and New York State DOT to basically look at uh, transit data and how it can be better utilized. That is a super quick overview. <laughs> it cannot, I could not possibly do it just as I do encourage you to take a look at, you know, if you have a particular interest in any one of those subject areas, um, you know, take a look at the tasks that we have in there. Um, you know, I've heard from some of you that, you know, we don't do enough in this subject area, we do too much in this other subject area, but unless we hear from you during this comment period, it's hard for us to know what the needs are. So we definitely encourage you to take a look, give us your feedback. Um, we have, like I said, the next month to review this um, and we can tweak it uh, for our policy board's uh, approval in March. Um, this final slide on this subject is, it's a lot of technical fun source speak, but I just wanted to show you all in with all the local matches, all of our resources, that our work plan is valued at up over $5 million. Um, it's, a, it's a significant investment. That's part of why we're staffing up right now. We're, we're severely understaffed. Um, we're actually down. We just hired uh, Kyan Simon. He has just joined us this week. Um, we have another new employee starting um, in two more weeks. We will likely be hiring at least one, if not two additional people this year. Um, it just depends on how the budget plays out, but for sure we're, we're higher one, um, and that will help us to make progress on this, on this significant work program. I do not, and I will say this very clearly, because of the way we have to show and quote, obligate all of our planning funds, this work program is probably a work program for 20 people. I do not expect us to do every item that is in that work program this year. Some of that, some of that work might depend on circumstances, like we're all still waiting on the census data to be released. So some of the work there might not be able to be undertaken this year. Um, but, and there's new guidance still coming from the federal government related to the infrastructure bill. So there's some flexibility in here. This is always gonna be subject to change, but it should give you a pretty good sense of of where we are. So in terms of to close, in terms of the action where we are now, the action before you is to approve the draft UPWP for public comment and open that public comment period. Like I said, it will run through Wednesday, March 2nd. Um, our staff at that time is going to respond to whatever comments we receive. We'll edit the draft document and then we're going to present it to our policy board on March 3rd. It's tight. Um, it's not ideal. We'll try to do better next year when we have more time to scope this out earlier at the end of the summer 
uh, give folks more time to think about it. Um, but that is where we were at. We are at on the UPWP. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Wow. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. It's a, it's a significant document and it's good that we have a public comment period for everybody to sort of review it, digest it. You know, we are definitely open to comments um, and suggestions. There's probably things that we didn't think about that you folks might have as um, priorities or needs in the region. Um, you know, again, the public comment period will be interesting to see what once we get beyond the group here. Um, that works with us frequently, you know, what other ideas or issues are coming up, but um, that's where we're at. Continuity from prior periods is shown, but there's some evolution with new areas of focus is one way to summarize. Absolutely. But this is our work program for the MPO, which is similar to all MPOs nationwide Correct. and statewide. Yeah. Um, so that's a high altitude view. Um, so it's welcome. Any other discussion around the table for the overall program? For, for my view, this is a continuity is, is what's important and with the new, you know, evolution, of course, with evolution, uh, areas of focus or at least challenges and opportunities every every year, every period, but we're moving forward. And best uh, good faith efforts, but due diligence, all that is, is clearly demonstrated to address current needs to preserve and enhance our system. So, uh, are we ready to vote? Is there uh, Bob, you know, please. You know, to Steve and, and Sandy, I, maybe we've had some conversation, and maybe not particular to this program cycle, but you know, particular emphasis area in the new visions plan is related to system preservation. And sort of a discussion around a, some committee work related to, uh, you know, types of uh, simple pavement treatments and the implementation of those. Or we've also had some discussion about, you know, being competitive with our bridge project solicitations. And so I know because of the timetable, not really working for this, but I would look and, I, and I, I'd hope for some other folks around the table to sort of a, a component of the following year's work plan that we do have some committee work particularly related to the pavement and bridge preservation side so you know that fits in under our infrastructure planning task um i tried as best i could to include some things about um you know working with DOT on payment and bridge condition data, uh, looking at forecasting for infrastructure, um, developing unit costs, but we can, we can tweak, further tweak this if um, you know folks have concrete ideas. The TIP committee doesn't have to necessarily be a TIP it's only committee, it could be an infrastructure committee um, too. Um, that's up to you folks, but you know, we'll certainly take those comments and further adjust it. You know, like I said, I'm not, for in terms of categories, the major adjustment of getting some additional resources available for locally administered pavement preservation and in bridge candidate work. Are you talking about more tip capital side, or are you talking about planning work? There's a difference. That's why. I well, the planning. I, I, yeah. That that the scoping and sort of preliminary engineering that there are resources to. Either best practices on, on some of the things that yep. that DOTs do, or others that just to advance that component of the new visions piece in, in terms of infrastructure preservation. Sure, we can we can yeah. have that as part of our infrastructure planning. Okay. Uh, That's okay. the so it's a sec, uh, section uh, three, pages thirty four and thirty five of the draft document. If you want to look at the the details Sandy summarized. Um, any other discussion? I uh, mentioned pavement condition inventories. Is that through all four county areas? Um, so those uh, we have um, a couple of things. The we do a non-federal aid pavement inventory. I believe Teresa, you're actually Teresa. Are you on the uh, video call? You might want to answer that one. Yes, yeah, so historically we've done, we have contracts with 
uh, Albany County for an annual pavement condition inventory, the city of Albany for a biannual pavement condition inventory, and as Sandy noted, uh, we'll be taking on a um, biannual inventory with the city of Schenectady starting this year. But historically, we have also done uh, a non-state federal aid inventory biannually. Um, that is now being done by DOT with an automated vehicle. So as long as we, um, we last did that this year, or in 2021 rather, as long as we can um, are assured that we can get the data from DOT on that, uh, we will no longer be doing that inventory. And then also in the past, every four years, we did um, the remaining three counties, Rensselaer, Saratoga, and Schenectady County routes, um, just kind of a comparison to have that data for our, our regional reports, and also a random local sample of roads to see how, you know, local roads that weren't county or federal aid, um, you know, how municipalities were, were catching up with that. One of the items in that um, task is to do a survey of all our local municipalities to kind of see what, what they're doing for pavement ratings, um, whether they're doing them in-house, what kind of technology they're using, uh, whether it's a consultant effort and just kind of, um, you know, gauge possibly future needs. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, it's You're welcome. Focus on PCI. Any other discussion before we vote on adopting and going to public release with, with this uh, planning update? I have one one question. Uh, I noticed in there um, some of the funds. It's, it looks like uh, rainy day fund uh, expansion. Do there's some money available for the regional household travel survey? Can you talk a little bit about? Yeah. That? So I didn't want to overcomplicate things, but. In addition to our allocation of planning funds, we also have what we term the backlog. Um, like you said, it's sort of the rainy day fund. Um, our rainy day fund, because we were so understaffed this year, um, grew significantly. Um, you know, we we lost two employees that had pretty significant salaries that, <laughs> um, you know, didn't get spent. So that backlog grew tremendously. And what we uh, in this, were required in the UPWP to um, provide us what we'll call a spend down plan and how we're gonna use these, these resources. So our thinking is because of the age of our regional travel, household travel survey, which dates to the 1980s, um, it's never been updated. Um, part of the logic when our, my former colleague was here is that this region hasn't grown that much, but yet it has grown enough and travel patterns are changing over the course of 40 years. If, it were, if we had just updated 10 years ago, I could say, yeah, but after 40 years, I think, you know, we're going to be looking at a major investment um, that is an expensive project, um, but it's necessary to keep our regional travel demand model um, honest um, and make sure that our planning assumptions are um, as I won't use the word accurate because it's, it's as good as we can get them. Let's put it that way. Um, so yeah, we are going to explore our uh, options this year um, and then possibly make a, a major investment once we see the census data come out and what it's saying. Um, so yeah, that's that's our that's our plan for the spend out of that large backlog. I mean, COVID is going to put impact in those patterns. And Absolutely. I don't know if you want to wait till but it's over to go back to normal, the new normal. <laughs> yeah, and one of the challenges we all have is what when is the new normal here? You know, I think I think that we st it's still uncertain to me. Um, you know, there's some off you know, I use this office building as a constant example. I don't think the insurance company upstairs is ever coming back here. I think they're riding out their lease and I think they're gone. Um, you know, there's other offices in here that are going to go on hybrid sort of schedules, you know, and so where are these people going to be in the daytime? Well, many of these employees probably live scattered all over the region. Um, so places that never saw traffic, whether it be foot traffic, transit use or driving or seeing new travel patterns. Um, we just have to keep forging ahead. That's why we're doing the traffic data collection ourselves and spot checking some locations that, you know, DOT does the routine traffic volume counts every couple of years, but we're doing specific spot checks on, on, on roads um, that may have 
may have been impacted uh, by the public. So you yeah. said that this has kind of been quashed a number of times uh, with the perception internally, I guess, that nothing has changed to warrant a new survey. Yet, I, I strongly disagree with that. And I'm wondering how come that never or did that reach the table for discussion as to whether or not it should be done? Or was it just kind of yeah. pushed off? I, mean, I think, I mean, it's something to consider that we should definitely have it at least every 10 years, regardless of the situation of change, because things will change, even if the perception of change does not exist. COVID may have diminished certain travel patterns, but it's increased others. People want things delivered to their houses. There's a lot more individual and, and commercial transportation going on rather than commuting. So even though things change or things don't seem to change all that much, things change. And I just don't want to see it get pushed off by a decision saying, eh, it doesn't look like it changed that much going into the future and have it as something that either should be must be done every 10 years on a 10 year cycle or sooner if, if it warrants. Yep. Um, Chris Bauer, could you speak to, um, he's listening in online, he's our, our travel demand model. Could you speak to this issue a little bit? Sure. So um, two, uh, two um, points I just wanted to make. One is, you know, I mean, and I, I'm sort of speaking on behalf of former staff, but it wasn't really ignored all that time. Um, the general um, strategy was to use uh, the data available that we get for the region and the state for the National Travel Household Survey and compare that to ours and then kind of use that as a gauge for how much have things changed, you know, and is it significant enough? And and in the past, the decision was to, to not update it um, because of the great cost. Um, the second point that I wanted to make was um, I think that we are going to do some kind of household travel survey in the future. I don't think it's a matter of if. I think it's more a matter of what kind of household travel survey are, are we going to do. Um, and I don't want to get into all the details, but just kind of a high level overview of that. The traditional way of doing it is a, is a survey, like a phone survey or an app that's on your phone. Um, that, you know, is completed by individuals and it's a sample. Um, the, the kind of new way of doing it or a different way of doing it is using location-based data, big data, uh, cell phone data, essentially. And then there's a third way, which is a hybrid. And um, one of our goals for this next year is going to be to understand what's the best tool for us and, you know, makes the most sense in terms of budget as well. Thanks, Chris. One other issue with... Um that's a local issue, and I think is a local issue for a number of municipalities, is truck traffic going where no truck traffic is allowed. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if there's anybody looking at that. And it's, you know, anecdotally, they say it's because the truckers are using regular, you know, GPS yeah. systems, that's and it's issue. telling you to go that way to get around the center of the village, yeah. in our case. We've got a number of, of roads that are used, and you know, enforcement takes people. You know, you can't put somebody there 24 um, 7. You know, I, I think it's a, an issue beyond you know, our village. Um, like this, you know, where would it fit? Where could we look at solutions? So, Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot again if you don't mind. Uh, could you talk about? this issue with respect to the freight advisory committee? Sure. So this is something that we do talk about a lot. And there's obviously a lot of different, um, you know, sides of what you just mentioned there. Um, so, you know, we have, um, it is a topic that we talk about our freight advisory committee. We do, um, you know, bridge uh, strikes and things like that in particular. Um, you know, that's one thing that's come up. Uh, truck routing, I mean, we don't, you know, generally we're talking about regional kind of issues, but 
you know, that's something that we could look at on a more um, case by case basis. I mean, it, it is, you know, it, it is complicated. There are some different ways of handling it. Um, you know, there are some situations where, you know, you, there isn't much of a choice. You know, if we have access routes, state access routes, national highway system, things like that. So I'm not sure that I can, can cover all that here. Um, you know, as far as where we could talk about it in the UPWP, I mean, that would fall somewhere under freight planning or maybe tech assist. Well, that's the committee. To, well, that's the committee to go to, exactly. Freight needs quarterly. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. We can we can uh, get you in touch with Chris. Okay. Yeah. Free advisory committee. The representations from the trucking community is there. Any other discussion? We're ready to vote on item four B and C combined, which releases this for public review. Is that uh, we ready for a motion? Everybody comfortable? Mark, Sean. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstaining or opposed, I have four B and C are hereby adopted. Next up is the public participation plan amendment. Um, uh, Jen, yep, Jen, could you uh, give an overview of the proposal? Um, sure. So when we adopted the new public participation plan, um, there were some public review period requirements in there that um, we had used historically and we didn't really change them as new ways of reaching out to the public and gathering information change. So with the upcoming TIP and with this current UPWP, we are asking to um, condense the public review period for some of our major products. We still are committed to the goals of thorough and continuous and innovative engagement. Um, we'll still be reaching out to the public in all of the ways we used to um, and using more online, virtual and technological ways of gathering information. So today we're just asking um, for you to approve the new minimum public review period, which is in the uh, furthest right-hand column. Days, days. And just to emphasize, this is minimums. The federal law does not have um, any specifications other than, I believe, on TIP and uh, orange <coughs> plan. Is that correct, Jen? Um, the federal requirements are actually for the public participation plan. They require a 45 day public review period. Um, so after that, all of our other major products just have to comply with what we have in our public participation plan, which is why we um, need to, why we're asking for this amendment, because it needs to be adopted and consistent with the plan. Um, Sean, question? Uh, what's the 25 days? Why is 25 days a number that sticks out here? It sticks out because of the month of February, what we're in right now. We couldn't fit in a 30-day public review between this meeting and our policy board. So we have to go with 25 as our minimum to meet the letter of what we're saying. But as you guys know, we do more. Um, these are these are the this would be the bare minimum. Um, the other factor is our tip update this year. Um, this is going to be the latest we've ever even started the process. I'm very concerned about there's no Frankly, I don't think there is a way we can get 60 days. Um, so 25 to 30 days is more realistic. Uh, but again, we'll do, for many of these products, we will do a minimum of 30 days um, as much as we can. We'll, we will err on the side of doing more, not less. Uh, but we just wanted to codify that we have a, a 60 day um, review period for our regional plan and our TIP um, and 30 days for our UPWP are just we're going to go down to 25 so that we can address sort of time frames, honestly. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'd speak in support of the motion here. I heard it's not a motion yet, but I, I, the conversations with Sandy, I, I, a lot of the 60 days is related. They're just outdated, related to the mail service, post on written comments, this sort of period. I mean, the staff here has always been very proactive in terms of multiple multi-platform approach to engaging 
the public here and, and you know it, it's always the privy of this body to have a longer period if so desired for a particular item that comes up but uh, it just it, for administrative purposes it, it, it seems to make sense to scale some of the minimums back and then in general usually most of your comments come in your first two weeks because after that you forgot it's there to comment on so most of your comments are on the front end anyway so most people don't wait 58 days to go oh yeah i need to comment on that that was going to be my next question was you know looking back historically do most of the comments that come in meet this timeline are we getting anything that's waiting until 60 days and it's okay we it's usually as exactly as they describe, you know, with social media and electronics now, um, people are sending them right away and we tend not to get much of anything towards the end. You know, if anything, the digital world will increase our reach um, rather than mailings and postcards. We're going to talk about mailings later on in this related to this group, but, you know, it's just things are evolving and time frames are shrinking and some of it's just beyond our control um well i'll have a tip of tip of date this year i'm happy to move that that's fine i have one question or a sure. question do we need federal concurrence with this adoption by the committee uh, some of these are federal statutory with the 23 code of federal regs 45 2316 so, so jen did coordinate with maria um Getting her new very name. I'm sorry, Hayward. 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 Oh, sorry about that. Um, formerly known as Maria Chow. But Jenny, can you speak to that? Sure. Um, I did review these with uh, Maria at Federal Highways, and she um, ensured me that the public participation plan is the only product that require that has um, a minimum required through uh, federal legislation. Thank you, Jen. All right, that's a relief. A second motion. Are we ready to vote? Adam, you have a point? This is a permanent change, correct? This is, yeah. yes. Good, good. Yeah, the imperative is noted. Okay. Uh, who moved it? It was a oh, second. Moved by, moved by Sean. Sean, second by Adam. Thank yeah. you all in favor. Please say aye. 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 Any abstain or opposed? Our new participation schedule deadlines are hereby adopted. Now we move into. Yeah. Section five on the agenda. Uh, yeah. um, so, um, as you may have guessed, looking at your packet today, um, we didn't have uh, much to share with you at this point on the transportation improvement program. Um, given that, I coordinated with uh, Greg at NISDOT, and we're going to give a little presentation today um, about what we're doing, um, you know, how CDTC approaches building uh, a TIP. Um, DOT is going to share some information about the approach to building and uh, developing the funding allocations, um, and just a few other reminders and some some discussion that we want to have with you folks on how to approach the TIP development given this hybrid meeting format and some other things that are going to be evolving quickly. So I'm going to start. Uh, please let me know, Jen, if I have not shared my screen correctly. Um, working off a laptop for which the software <laughs> set up, which is frustrating, but we're getting there. <coughs> Our technology challenges here. Um, just one second. Okay, Jenna, are you seeing the slides? Not as slideshow. Now I see it in presenter view. You see it as presenter view? Okay. Mm -hmm. How about now? Yep, it's all good. good. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's um, just for, again, we do have people um, on the committee that were not a part, part of the committee back in 2019. So just in fairness to everybody in terms of how we approach this, um, I just wanted to quickly go over what we do and why we do it. So in terms of developing the TIP, the long-term CDTC goal is to produce a TIP that is balanced 
and contributes to implementation of new visions. That's the foundation of everything that we do here. Um, we have these 15 new visions planning and investment principles, all of which align with some of those federal planning principles that I mentioned earlier. Um, they are the centerpiece of our long range plan um, and help guide the development of the criteria we use in the evaluation process. Um, as you guys have remember, New Visions was developed through uh, years of task force work and an evolutionary uh, planning uh, process that uh, has reaffirmed New Visions over the course of many years. The original New Visions plan was adopted in 1995. It was groundbreaking at its time, um, and we have evolved it to what it is today, um, which is still a work in progress as things continue to change and evolve quickly. Um, and as we talked about earlier today, all of this influences the priorities uh, for planning in our, in our work program. So how does the TIP process work? All right, so best practices steps uh, it, that we have had, had, I said best practice, past practice um, is on our your left-hand side and what's happening now is on your right-hand side. So the first thing that we normally do as we develop a TIP is NICE.Main main office determines the federal fund planning targets and allocations. For the eight county region, that's nice dot region one. <clears throat> and then that gets further suballocated to CDTC in coordination with nice dot DOT, uh, nice dot and AGFTC, um, so that you know we we divvy it up amongst the, the, the eight county region. Um, Greg wanted to share with you, and I'll stop sharing my screen on, uh, on this presentation and start Greg's. Uh, wanted to share a little bit about how those planning uh, targets are developed. And let me get your presentation going here. Yeah, no, I, I, I want to do an overview of the very basics. Uh, I'll let you confirm that's working. Sure. <laughs> yes. Okay, Jen, are we working okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Can you hit the next one. Uh, sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, you know, uh, really, the, 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 I'm going to try to be as very basic as possible because there's so many moving parts that go into planning target building. Um, it, it does start with a needs assessment of the system. And that needs assessment is, uh, I'll head on this more on a later slide, but it starts with a needs assessment of everything. And then we go to federal highway funds available, which you know, we'll talk about the highway bill here in a few minutes, a little bit. Uh, the needs assessment does hit on the non-federal aid system. Just uh, and frankly, it's an awareness. Uh, you can actually hit the next slide. It, as this is part of the needs assessment, it really goes to inform the statewide budget process for CHIPS, the last year's touring route program, Culvert New York, the Great New York program is federally funded, but the Culvert New York estate funds, and others, other needs that are not federally eligible. For the purpose of this table, because this is where federal highway dollars are discussed, we're going to skip over and otherwise exclude the non federal aid system for the purpose of this discussion. And then we assemble planning targets. So, uh, next. so the needs assessment, you know, it, it starts and it's not just preservation, it, it starts with S, it does start with asset modeling. Uh, you know, what is a state of good repair? It's different for everything you talk about. You know, pavements, pavement every 12 to 15 years. Bridges are replaced every 75 years. It's traffic signals are replaced every 40 years. Guide rail. Every asset under the world has a, a cycle and a number and a condition. It's all figured out in massive modeling efforts. Other needs include congestion mitigation, road diets, enhancements, things of that nature, then complete streets, uh, jump enhancements, the sustainability <coughs> efforts, uh, and then major projects. There are numerous major projects all across the state that could benefit respective areas or larger areas. And, in the, and again, the entire network's considered uh, regardless of ownership. You know, state, local authorities, etc. So, where does it start? Federal aid planning targets. 
know, where do we get uh, where do we get the funding? It obviously starts with the highway bill, which we all hear the fanfare about. One thing that comes with highway bills, well, first there has to be an appropriation. Thus far, the appropriation hasn't happened yet from the bipartisan infrastructure bill. But whenever an appropriation happens, there's, it also comes with what's called an obligation authority. So we never are get or almost never are given a hundred percent obligation authority. It usually bounces between ninety and ninety-seven percent. You know, and it varies by year, varies by appropriation bills. So obligation authority actually comes out of the highway bill pie. The rest of it lands in the planning target budget. So in just in plain English, that basically means that you're only allowed to spend up to 90% of even though you might have $100, you're only allowed to spend 90 yet. Now, that is tempered by what's called advanced construction. I'm going to get to what that is in a minute because what on earth is advanced construction? There will picture a credit card there, so I'll get there in a minute. And then there's also something called August redistribution, which I'll speak to where that comes from. So, so advanced construction. That's construction or AC for short, it's basically borrowing ahead on a federal fund source. And we're allowed to borrow ahead up to two years. We are always borrowed ahead, and this is a good thing. Uh, I don't know, borrowing that bad. No, this is actually a good thing, and I'll get to that in a couple minutes. But in a five year program update period, the funds available are represented by subtracting out what we're AC today adding on a future anticipated AC amount. So here I'm showing an AC of one year. Here's the next one for illustration, we could AC less. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to illustrate here. Oh, is it? Yeah, sorry. next slide. Yeah. Sorry about that. So we can, oh, here we can AC less, which reduces your funds available. Here's the next one. Or we can max it out and go to a full two-year advanced construction and roll those funds into a five-year update. We usually shoot somewhere in the middle. Oh, that's good. Ed. <laughs> so here's why here's why AI, AC is a good thing to practice. Um, we always want to be borrowed ahead to some amount of funds. Because every August, Federal Highway goes to all the states that are spending all of their funds, and they say, okay, here's a pot of money that's not going to get obligated before October 1st. So you basically got 45 days to figure this out. If they come to us in August, we got to have it done by September 15th to obligate all of the redistributed money. Most of this money comes from like research programs that are underexpended and whatnot. This is a pretty predictable amount of funds that Federal Highway comes to New York with every year. And it's in the tens of millions of dollars, so it's not insignificant. It's real money. But the only way we're able to spend it is by having an advanced constructed amount out there and you pay it down in the 45 days. So we're paying down some of that borrowed ahead funds. And that way we bring the maximum amount of funding into New York State. So that is all, all those things are added together to build a planning card. So it's not like every odd the planning card changes, it's all baked in. So here we are. We arrive at our planning targets, we got a little sack of money, and we got our needs. One could argue we could do system preservation entirely and all the money. We could do all major projects. We could do sustainable enhancements. So, what do we actually do? We, you know, New York State, as the stewards of the federal funds, uh, you know, this is where it, it gets a little more detailed. That needs assessment is looked at to spread amongst the funds amongst various categories, similar to what New Vision says. You shouldn't just do one thing, you should try to do a little bit of everything. To that end, the Federal Highway Focus has grown on the NHS-centric uh, focus right from Congress. Uh, the NHS funding availability is the one fund category that continues to grow 
while the rest of the funds are what some call anywhere money. Here we call them the STB or STBG fund or the urban flex and off system. Those are anywhere funds. That fund, those fund categories are not growing and they haven't grown in the past few highway bills. But the NHS spending has grown. And it's brought with it performance measures, bridge targets, pavement conditions, interstate conditions. It also does bring with it congestion and delay and safety targets. The long and short is the focus really has become the NHS. And so DOT is a federal requirement that all states have an asset management plan. And part of the reason for that is that most states are the owner of 80 to 90% of the federal aid system and definitely 90% of the NHS. So New York State has an asset management plan that really does also focus on the NHS. Um, you know, one thing that should note that actually helps Region 1, oh, you're all right. One thing that helps Region 1 in the um, needs assessment and asset management is Region 1 is the first region that is actually a DOT owned Hudson River crossing. And we own 18 of them. Every Hudson River crossing in the south is owned by an authority that collects tolls. Uh, so that actually helps our needs assessment. Uh, the other thing that helps is our is uh, region one owns the most interstate lane miles of any region. <clears throat> a lot of interstate focus, and of course, a lot of interstate bridges. Uh, those are things that <clears throat> influence the planning targets that are developed for region one. Uh, it shouldn't be lost that we also have an awareness of the local system. You know, we, we inspect all local land bridges and we are aware of the number of flags and, and such issue. Uh, again, all informs the uh, the said needs assessment. Um, so then, what do we do? We start a planning target assembly because of the NHS focus and and the transportation asset management plan. We start with getting after the most basic preservation with the use of multi site contracts that cover all eight counties. So we start with building the piece of the pie saying we're going to carve out this much for multi site work to extend the useful life in the most efficient way possible on the assets that are like prime for preservation. Uh, so we, we start here. And this number never meets what the actual need is, but it always represents some percentage of the identified preservation need. Uh, like I said, it's never, never 100%. Uh, then next we go on to site-specific preservation. Uh, you know, more major preservation projects are standalone. You know, past tip updates you see interstate paving projects. Uh, robust site-specific paving. Uh, the bridge we have, I-890 over Erie Boulevard is a you know, $9 million preservation project. Uh, again, all, all site-specific preservation. And then the last category is trying to get after some renewal. In, in Region 1, the focus really is on renewing bridges. Uh, you know, the, clearly the, that's kind of the biggest need with the biggest risk. So we do try to get after bridge replacements. Now for the next one. Unfortunately, in the renewal category, region one continues to fall short of our 75 year target, as, as shown here in our running average of bridge replacements. Um, but with that, with the funds available and trying to spread the funds around to all, all things, uh, this, this is where we can get with our, with our core funding. Uh, so then uh, moving on to the next one. This slide and the, one more. There we go. The funding allocations, as I said, it, it started with the NHS and the fact that the federal bills continue to grow in NHS focus. In the funds available, NHPP funding really represents somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of the federal aid available. Um, and 
there's a recognition that keeping the NHS in accepting stable condition is really where we're at with the use of NHPP with a recognition that regardless of ownership, the non-NHS does continue suffering condition. Uh, it doesn't mean it gets no attention, but we see collectively, regardless of whether we own it or I mean also own it, that the non-NHS does continue to uh, deteriorate at, at this time. So then the, the last piece is uh, trying to keep a carve out available for enhancements, more renewal or more preservation projects to, to get after all things, enhancements, sustainability, you know, all, all the other things that uh, are, are good goals and good parts of long range planning. So with that, then of course of that, we have to, uh, one more quick start. Yeah. Then, uh, as a regional picture, then of course this is where the suballocation happens. We have to suballocate all of these categories to the respective NPOs. So, and the and the two rural counties. So this is a sort of illustration of how that all unfolds. With that, I tried to go through that as quick as I could. <laughs> couldn't couldn't go too far. I'll mention oh, yeah. current current events and that happy our friends in Pittsburgh didn't see any more tragedy than a couple, mm -hmm. couple injuries here, which is um, miraculous. But, uh, any questions for me on planning target development? What is the gap? What, what you say you never get enough? The, the needs to the... Yeah, you know, <laughs> I don't, it's, it is a, it is a factor of multiple. It's, we're not like 75% there. We are, if you want to meet all the needs that are identified, I think you could very easily spend fivefold to really get after everything everybody wants to do. Well, but what is the, the real, I mean, what everybody wants to do is a little bit blue sky, I believe. I mean, but, but fixing all the bridges that yeah. you know are a state of good repair in all categories and some well-planned enhancements and system expansion where needed is probably about four to five fold wow. Th three to five fold i haven't seen the exact number recently but yeah three to five times where we're at to really get to that everyone is comfortable with their system situation. Is that the same other places as compared to us? I think I think nationally that's really just one of the yeah. Well I think it's illustrated. I mean Pennsylvania has a uh, they have a real issue related to the bridge condition as right. a whole. Uh, not not just with what happened. So I I mean, every state's a little different in how they approach it and, and where the ownership and maintenance ultimately lie. You know, I, I, I think I mean, Greg makes a good point that you know, in, in what is that in condition? Uh, ultimately, you'd like to be at a spot where things in normal preservation, sort of life cycle based investment, right. sort of keeps everything at a sort of level. And he said, I mean, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to get everything to that. So the, as your money comes in and you're sort of trying to pair it with the infrastructure need, I mean, it's just a continual sort of triaging of what within this short window, where's the best place to spend the money. Right. Sounds like what we deal with the village level or infrastructure. Right. It's all, it's it's all the same, level. same sort of discussion. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Bob and Greg. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I would, I don't know how you would document it. I'm sure you can, but uh, I think one of the unique things when we're talking about infrastructure is in my mind, I'm going to personalize it because we're talking about the bridges is I want everybody to always remember that these, these bridges that are a pain in the side of the city of Schenectady and the village of Scotia, and I'm sure multiple other municipalities, they have this giant asterisk on them 
with this railroad ownership controversy. And so I don't know if they got forgotten. I know the term is orphaned, but, you know, uh, I feel like they bring us down in a way artificially because, you know, my predecessors, who I know several of them, I will never say that they were not competent engineers, but they always operated for 20, 30, 40 years with the understanding that the railroad would maintain these bridges and they allowed them to go down, even when the DOT inspected them and said that they're not doing very well. And only recently under, fortunately, my tenure, uh, have we had to come to the realization that these bridges are failing and closing and in terrible condition, and we need to step up and repair them. And so I know that it, it probably is only a blip on the radar of your charts and graphs, but in the city of Schenectady, it's five. That Sunnyside Bridge in the village of Scotia is huge. It's a, like, like a four or five span railroad bridge that they've completely, you know, said, you deal with it. So I just I just would love to, if we ever write a, a, a report or a, a book or something on this, I'd always want to make sure that the footnotes are accurate so that it kind of shows the whole picture of that we weren't negligent in it, that we were, were given a, a different hand than we thought we were always dealt with these particular pieces of infrastructure. Don't yeah. worry, Chris, nobody's reading that book. <laughs> All right, good. In the, you know, in the need assessment, those things all rolled up, again, regardless of ownership. So it, it, it's unfortunate that they're ignored by the respective owner, but they're not ignored by the respective user, which yeah, but I mean, Greg, to that point, I mean, railroad bridges that the railroad owns are not on your radar, right? I mean, there's hundreds of them. They're rolled up in the needs assessment. You know, it, it, we, we do the needs assessment kind of blind at first cut blind to ownership and fund streams, you know, and uh, so those are they're rolled into the grand scheme. Okay, I didn't know. So the DOT does the inspection on rail bridges over rail and over water? It'd be a consultant, but yeah, Chris, yeah. they are rolled up. Okay, so, good. And I, I mean, I mean, you're highlighting a good point. I, I mean, it's not just a regional or statewide or even a national sort of issue. I, any railroad corridor that they're on paper responsible for the, the substructure, you know, it, it from their argument from that perspective, they have other track and culvert and drainage sort of needs when they're prioritizing stuff. Right? But, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Andrew, yeah. Greg, I just want to talk to you and the onion that you presented, I, I tried to take mental notes, but there's a lot of layers here, I know. You showed a slide for advanced construction, usually you're looking at middle of the pot pushing forward with, with advanced funding. But doesn't the opportunity cost really encourage you to spend as much as possible into the future on major projects so that when the adjustment comes, you are going to maximize that allocation so that you're assured of the full amount. And then the cost of money going forward is cheaper than the amount that you have in your pocket now to put towards major projects. So you hit on, I mean, the advanced construction piece of this is uh, an accounting equivalent to zero interest borrowing. Right. Is the you know, that, that mechanism lends itself very well for, for that. And I think generally in program updates, they err on the side of, they hate to max it out because then your flexibility is gone, but they do try to lean on the further side of towards two years than the less. And to word that, just let me go back to the major project though. Would we ever be without a major project on an annual basis? That's a good question. I mean, this kind of gets to the bigger highway bill increases. You know, the, the highway bill is going to bring 
right, jumping a little bit of words. We're going to talk about later, but maybe it fits now. The highway bill does bring to reach the New York State, I believe, about four and a half to five billion in additional federal aid. And so, because of numerous major projects around the state, instead of we're anticipating fairly flat regional targets because the major projects are going to soak up the increase in the highway bill. And frankly, that's a good thing because otherwise, regions would have gone down in order to fund even some of the major projects. So it is an opportunity for the state to get after major priorities. And it's not lost, it's been announced publicly. Well, I mean, the Livingston app bridge, I mean, it was committed to by the governor. And I, I mean, you're talking about a $250, $300 million investment that is sort of off the top or Kensington, the freeway or, or I-81, so yeah. Syracuse, those, those sort of things. Yeah. So ju just to, to wrap up the argument, it seems that the flexibility that you mentioned that the bean counters want isn't necessarily needed when it appears that we would have dedicated major projects that the funding allocation would go to more or less in perpetuity. So why why are we taking such a cautious approach? Uh, I don't think we are. I think we are borrowing ahead most of the amount we're allowed to. Okay, because it just showed on, on the screen it looked like I showed that you're allowed to do more or less, okay. but I think I think they don't ever tell us exactly where we are, but they generally hand out targets based on a more advanced construction than less. Okay. And part of the reason for that is no matter what program update you put together, in aggregate, 100% of it's never delivered. So you want to plan on the max and deliver a little less than that. Because something always happens. Something falls off. So they... I mean, at some point before we can obligate a real actual phase, that AC needs to be converted to an actual fund source that you've got in hand. You can't just use that credit marker oh, that's, that's out there. So it, it helps with some flexibility of, because you don't know. We don't, if if the appropriations don't happen for the bipartisan bill into next year, say that Congress can't agree and there's not that, you still need to have some work, but none of those mega projects are going to be able to go in here. But we still want to be able to maintain some semblance of a regular program, even planning purposes using the AC, but you still ultimately have to convert it to, um, the cash in your pocket. Right. And do you um, ever, I don't mean to cut. Yeah, yeah, we we yeah. do have to move forward. Um, so let let's get through the presentation and then we'll uh, circle back to additional um, comments. So, you know, as Greg mentioned in his presentation, one of the reasons we haven't gotten our allocations yet is because of what's happening at the federal level and the federal budget. They have to still appropriate the funding. The current continuing resolution ends February eighteenth. Um, keeping that date in mind, backtracking our next planning committee meeting, uh, we're not going to have it on February 9th, we're going to have it on February 16th, we hope. <laughs> this is going to be the latest we have ever, my 23 years, that we have ever started a tip update. Um, it's unprecedented with a March policy board meeting, we normally would have a draft tip to release for public review, we're not going to be anywhere near that. I don't even know what we're going to be able to share with the policy board in March. It begs the question of whether that March policy board meeting should happen in March. Um, but we'll circle back to that. In terms of some of the other work that has been done to prepare, um, at our last meeting, as you know, we, we addressed all the existing TIP projects and for scope, cost, and schedule. Um, so that's all set. We still have to come back and, and address regional set-asides, hopefully again at that February 16th meeting. Uh, we've already done the solicitation for new candidate projects. We've already reviewed them. Um, sponsors have received a copy to comment on. We're currently uh, reviewing all those comments and folks will be getting uh, responses from us today or tomorrow at the latest. Um, and again, you know, we're just sort of waiting as you are with, um, and I'm gonna skip over the project programming process a little bit. We'll come back to that, but um, 
you know, we're, we're just waiting on the information from DOT to move forward. I did want to remind you about some housekeeping things because we're in a hybrid meeting environment and this is one of the most important tasks that we have here. Um, who votes um, and how this is going to work with Zoom? Um, so on your screen are the voting entities of this body. Um, the eight cities have a representative, the four counties have a representative, the town of Colony has a representative, and then we have one additional town and village rep, which right now is uh, Peter Town Rotterdam. Um, if he is not present, it rotates to the other towns and villages in the order that you're seeing on screen. The next person would be Bonanza. If that person's not here, we go to Bethlehem. Bethlehem not here, Skodak, and on down the list. It's basically by seniority. Um, and then we have our regional and state partners, the airport authority, the port, CERP, CCBT, and ISAD. So just wanted to remind you of that framework. Um, some folks have identified alternates if the people in this room or listening online who are voting members are not present. If you haven't identified an alternate, I would strongly encourage your entity to do so um, because this is going to be a tight process. Quorum is going to be important. Um, and we all have busy schedules. I know this is just probably one one percent of your day <laughs> your day and your day job um so I, I know it's a burden and we're going to be doing a lot of work in the next couple of months so um again I'll, I'll i'm happy to share any information if you're not sure if we have an alt designated alternate um we, we can follow up with you guys on that so how is this going to work in this hybrid environment I and mean, we've, we've done a good job kind of muddling through this um <laughs> But because of the sensitivity, I'm sure there'll be a lot of conversation when it comes to programming the tip. Um, we're going to ask that folks, um, you know, from this point forward, um, our members, our voting members, are encouraged to come here in person uh, to participate. If you are participating remotely, um, we'd like you to have your cameras on and your microphones muted unless you're um, voting. Um, obviously, if you're uh, interested in having discussion, you can use the raise hand feature um, or type a question in the chat. Um, Non-voting participants and interested parties should participate via Zoom. Um, if you are, and, and camera should be off, that'll just help us to manage and see who's voting where, um, because we just want to make sure we have an accurate accounting of, of the voting members. Um, do you guys have any questions about any of that, any concerns? Okay, so then in terms of the next steps, obviously we're just waiting on the tip guidance and the funding allocations. I think we're ready to roll as soon as we get that information. Um, as I mentioned, we're not going to hold a meeting next week. We will plan on having one on the 16th. I would bet my salary that we will be having one on February 23rd. <laughs> so, so definitely, um, you know, keep those dates in mind. Um, we will probably have to think about meeting in March in order to keep things moving forward. Um, we may have to adjust the date of our policy board meeting um, if there's nothing to share or you know, we'll just roll with it and they'll have to sub-delegate to this body um, the completion of the TIP update. Um, in terms of the mail, the meeting packages that we receive, um, you know, the mail system is not what it was. We all know that. Steve, did you ever get yours? No. So we should get the full package uploaded uh, at least a day or two ahead. Yeah. So I think what we'll do from this point forward, uh, we won't mail a packet anymore. It's just not worth it. We will email you the packet. Um, it is all available on our website. Um, but you know, in case you forget, or and then you know, for folks that show up in the here in the room, we'll have a few paper copies available just so you have it for reference. Um, but you know, there's just no way with the tight schedule that we're going to be able to turn around mail outs and get things uh, sent in snail mail, if you will, um, given that it's just not working so that well anymore. Be provided with the with the uh, meeting notice. Yeah. 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 Um, Sandy, does that mean um, the 16th there's a freight committee meeting? That's been, that's been canceled or rescheduled, I should say. Okay. The again, we have to work through all the set aside of proposals and program, and then you know, we'll talk in the next meeting about um, how we're going to go about programming the tip. We haven't been able to talk about that because we just don't have the information. Um, Nice dot and city to see staff will be working on developing um, some proposals for you folks to think about in terms of how to program these funds when they're released. Um, 
you know, again, from a CDTC's perspective, it's critical that we consider the new visions plan. I know from the department's perspective, as you just saw in the presentation, preservation work is very important. So there's a number of considerations that go into the programming process. Um, and just in the interest of time, you know, we'll we'll go over how we evaluated the projects at our, at our next meeting. Um, we'll try to, we'll try, you know, we're trying to be as transparent as we can, particularly since we have some new members. I know the long timers, I appreciate you, um, your patience as we uh, as we work through this, but um, anything else on the tip update that DMT wanted to add today? I mean, just a supplement. I that I, I mean, we're we're offering to sort of take the first cut at the candidate list today, just to give a starting point for the conversation. I know when we did this last time, we had several several multi-hour go-arounds to even start the conversation, the prioritizing the project based on eligibility and, and the category. So, I, I mean, I want to say that that the staff or DOT folks are dictating it. We're just going to put some scenarios out there together that fit. In terms and then use those as as a starting block to hopefully jump the conversation but we're not in any regard trying to dictate the, uh, the construct of the local program any other questions or comments yep. we don't need that wrapped up item five a and we're moving into 5B summary of the 2019 2020 Jacob, even. Uh, just the project selection. Page. Yep. Project selection moves. Um, advanced agenda. Yep. So we've had 15 project selection changes from January 5th uh, to the 26th uh, when the mail out was sent out. Uh, this is an unusually high number uh, this month, and that's due to the tip update exercise that we've done over the past month or so uh, to bring the current tip up to date. Um, and so with the exception of one project, uh, the last one on the list, SA 336, uh, these were all just ch schedule changes. Um, and SA 336 was the addition of 170,000 of each tip money. Um, so just providing this for information purposes. Any questions on the 15 projects outlined as project moves? January 6th through 26th of this year. Thank you, Jacob. Moving forward to 5C is the project delivery update. And again, Jacob. Um, okay, so this month, uh, based on our consultant updates that we've received, uh, we have quite a few project milestones that were hit uh, over the past few months. Uh, just going to go through those quickly. First one. Tip number A581, West Old State Road sidewalks in the town of Gilderland had ps &E submitted in December of last year. R310, Sand Lake Hamlet sidewalk enhancements, town of Sand Lake was let in June of 2021, uh, but construction will be, getting, will be beginning this spring. Uh, S247, Brandy Line Ave, uh, City of Schenectady, ps &E was submitted and construction authorized in January. And that's uh, the amendment that we just approved. Uh, looking forward to construction authorization there. A590, City of Albany Pedestrian Safety Action Plan. Uh, letting was held in November of 2021. S265, Freeman's Bridge Road, multi-use path, town of Glenville. Uh, NEPA concurrence was approved in December of 2021. And SA314 Fox Hill Road over Little Hans Creek Bridge, town of Edinburgh. Construction was completed in December of 2021. Uh, so, quite a few updates there. Um, next month, I will be reaching out to the village of Scotia, town of Clifton Park, city of Albany, and CDTA. Uh, to continue our monthly uh, local project updates. And also, you know, over the past few months here, we haven't done our uh, local presentation at the planning community meeting, but um, hopefully we'll get back into that in April. So I guess my plan is we'll continue this project delivery as of April 1st, next planning committee. 
the other planning committee meetings will be a tip focus. The you know, typical project order updates that will be mid month. So uh, that's the, the plan for the next month or so. Thank you, Jacob. Any questions or discussion? Forward. Next up is 5D, DOT project delivery schedule. Do you guys have a handout or anything for us? Uh, there's not a handout. There are just a couple things I wanted to talk about. Over the past couple weeks, we've let the Route 20 over Schoharie Creek, the deck, the deck replacement was at $2.9 million. And uh, Northway resurfacing between exit 15 and 16, which is about $4.5 million. Each of those were, were within a couple hundred thousand of the estimate. So we're happy with the competitiveness and, and uh, the number of bidders that are out there. We do have about $26 million in paving to be let tomorrow on our, our two corrective maintenance projects and also the, the major, the pavement rehab on 890, uh, about a $17 million job. And, and it's it's going to go out in two weeks from now. So those are the remainder of the chunks for, for this program period. Any questions for DOT on project deliveries? Uh, you guys experienced any uh, price increases in materials, steel, any uh, significant increases in lead times, get, get things with the uh, lead time, lead time, lead time yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah, not so much material. I mean, material source locally hasn't been as much an issue, but certainly anything fabricated that's coming from somewhere else. Like even course, fencing, pipe, simple you know, connections, mm -hmm. pipe, right, all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. So, I mean, aggregate and stone at the air source locally, there hasn't been as much an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other discussion on DOT? Next up is CDTC. Uh, planning activities, Sandy? I, I spoke enough, but in your packet, you see the update of all of our consultant led work. So if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Very good. Thank you. So, about 20, we're into regional and local planning activities. First up is Mark at Regional Planning. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, doing our spring training series again. Um, in the month of April and May, I believe it's going to be virtual again this year. Hopefully, we'll be back to in person in the fall. <clears throat> we made updates to our Capital Region Indicators website to now include geographies of school districts and zip codes. Um, we're launching our new Climate Smart Communities Coordinator Program, working directly with communities um, with our outreach coordinator team to advanced goals that are listed under the Climate Smart Communities Program of the Department of Environmental Conservation. We're in the process working with CEG, uh, uh, undertaking a supply chain study focused on offshore wind. So that's going to be focusing on the ports of Coimans and, um, and Albany and the upstream industries that are related to that industry. And finally, we're, we're working with uh, our counties right now to uh, figure out what kind of projects we're gonna be focusing on related to broadband. We've received about $167,000 from the Northern Water Regional Commission to look at broadband in the region. And so we're working with stakeholders to figure out how to allocate that money right now. Thanks, Mark. Any questions for Mark on regional? And the census has not been, final census numbers have not been released yet. What's the crystal ball show? Uh, this crystal ball still says tentative 2022. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Any other discussion? Um, next up is CDTA. Is it Ross or Chris? Ross? Um, hi, everyone. We, the uh, thing to report on is just a series of service changes that we rolled out at the end of the month. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, you'll see we adjusted about uh, 14 or 15 uh, bus routes. Uh, in the system, we also made an adjustment to our micro transit uh, service, increased its hours of operations and uh, matched its fare uh, to our fixed route. Uh, won't go into any more detail on that. Everything's on our uh, website. Thank you, Ross. Any questions on the CDTA initiatives? Thank you, Ross. Next up, DOT again, Bob Rice, will bring anything to add? Yeah, you know, I, did, I just wanted to take it a little bit further in terms, I know that we're waiting for the allocations here at the MPO table. I did want to say that last week we presented our proposed program to the DOT commissioner and the executive team, and we're waiting sort of for the feedback of that. 
each of the regions has to do that as part of this exercise. And I probably half the regions are done right now. And as we alluded to, you know, we consider our responsibility, primary responsibility to be the preservation of the NHS system as well as doing everything else. But it it's a substantial investment. As as Greg said, you know, it showed it takes most of the pie to keep the NHS network and its bridges uh, in a in a in a state of not good repair, but acceptable, serviceable <laughs> condition. I, you know, we illustrate in particular, you know, from the Patroon Island Bridge in 90 down 787 uh, past the mall down to, to the throughway. I mean, that represents about 25% of all of our bridge infrastructure in the entire region. It's just within that three mile corridor. Or so, I mean, just the preservation of that and the, and the magnitude. So I, I didn't say, so even the stuff Greg presented, what even makes it more complicated is the state budget process. So we, we talk a lot about a lot of federal aid that's out here, but the reality is the federal aid is only there if you play by all the rules that, and you get to seek reimbursement somewhere down the road. So it is contingent on everything is first instance through the state budget process, which has its own set of timetables and, and as well as you know ultimately an agreement with the legislature. So uh, if if the governor's announcement via the state of the state, in addition to the large projects that we talked about a little bit, I mean, certainly the commitment to the CHIPS program and the PAVE New York, there's something called Operation PAVE Our Potholes. We're not, none of us, <laughs> none of us are quite sure yet what that means, but I'm sure it'll be a meaningful investment. You know, the Bridge Culver New York program, as well as, as the touring route, program with state monies to the municipalities, to the uh, cities, I, I mean, will be welcome investment, but that sort of overlays that process happening at the same time. The federal appropriations don't mean anything if there weren't state appropriations to start it in first instance, the whole thing. I, I did want to mention a couple staff changes that we have going on. We've got Alex Poland is a, a young engineer who started to join us and uh, Joe Thompson, sort of veteran of, of DOT that's been around a few ages or, or coming to join our local programs unit to work with Lorenzo and Lorenzo, uh, the two Lorenzos. So they're, they're gonna be reaching out, particularly as we get the remainder of the schedules for your projects that still may be due this year or things that are coming up in the next year. We do end up with a commitment list that folks see for, for the 22-23 year and so they're going to be reaching out as well as to make some introductions uh kelly kircher is is on the line here she's going to be joining us on the program side with both a lot of consultant as well as, as uh dot design experience like there to so uh, you'll you'll certainly be engaging around this forum in, in terms of uh a program going forward so that's it thank you bob really appreciate the updates it's always evolving and uh, the partners in progress. Yeah. I had a question for Bob. Yeah. You know, I, I recently saw Massachusetts, Lexington, Massachusetts, has taken those sound barriers and doing some solar installations on those. Like, has DOT explored anything like that in New York at all? Group, I mean, not particularly with DOT, but I know the uh, NYSERDA and the, there are coalitions looking for every place we have provided every place that we have DOT ownership of a parcel that is a potential site for solar. I mean, haven't seen something specific. Some of them are in the highway right away. I don't know if you've seen anything else. I, I haven't really. I mean, in region one, we don't, the only noise walls we own are the new ones at exit four and the old wood, wood ones on route seven. Well, that's why I was thinking the exit four, maybe that's an opportunity to pilot something because they're taking advantage of the vertical element and not so much having to worry about the horizontal. So, yeah, we we haven't initiated anything in our region yet. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that back. Though. I'll share. I'll, I don't know if you've seen it, but I'll send. I'll yeah, send if there's a link or something. Yeah, I'd certainly like to share that. Yeah, right? like I said, they're looking. If there's a square footage we can rent for somebody to generate some power, the state is interested. Yeah, Nasty OT is getting some revenue. Right, so, further, very good. Moving forward, uh, is anyone on from Two Way Authority? I don't believe so. Phil. Uh, Dropped off. Next up is the airport authority. Speak to that. Um, 
Energy resilience is a key area. We're up to 150 solar panels, powering our 32 electric vehicle charging stations. We're moving forward with our first and um, 20 year master plan uh, with the CAJ and Jacob, uh, Jake Daniels. And uh, that is uh, an active initiative, almost 30% uh, stage. It's a challenging time to be doing master planning, but we are, we are moving forward. Uh, for existing facilities and proposed facilities with a 20 year horizon, similar to new visions here at this table. Um, the DIL uh, is something that it was authorized last November and still awaiting the appropriators. And thank you for your excellent presentation, Greg. Uh, is that something we might share on our MPO, CTC MPO site? It was good general information on our, yeah. our primary, good, excellent slideshows. Uh, but back on the airport, um, we're holding our own cargoes up 10% very strong, uh, part of the pandemic and passenger travel is still lagging a little bit pre-pandemic, at least 80%, kind of at a plateau, 80% of where we were in 2019. Uh, new service to Nashville starting up. We've got the direct to LaGuardia, the easiest way to get into the city, a 40 minute flight on Delta. Um, so we're pushing forward, got 6 million paving going, um, we mobilized for the winter, but we've got Every 10 years, we've got to restore the roadways and taxiways. And so that's a big part of our ongoing program. I uh, welcome any questions on the airport. Thanks for flying all of them. Great. I mean, I've got to say, I mean, I told Steve, it's pretty slick. You go in their garage and it'll tell, we flew out there a couple of weeks ago and it tells you the number of spaces that are available on a given thing. And, and it runs literally to the spot. There's a little green light overhead or a red light if it's occupied through the whole thing. It's Better you try to park in a garage, airport garage, anywhere else. Uh, it's a welcome. We're going to be state of the art. State well, of the yeah. art over there. I thought <laughs> it was leading edge technology. I can't remember where you parked when you got home. There's a whole kiosk. I can't remember where your parking spot is. Oh, sure. The kiosk yeah. will guide you. Tickets are color coded. Yeah. A lot of thought went into all that planning. <laughs> easy in, easy out. Thanks for playing all, but yeah, it is fuel efficient. Anyway, look forward to that. Thank you. Um, Port Authority is not present. Uh, Pat is actually uh, online. Unless you just oh, I'm, sorry. Off. I'm sorry. I'm on Zoom. There you are. Hi. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Pat. Yes. Yep, please. Thanks, Steve. Hey, Steve, how come every time I park at the airport, I'm in like the fourth lot out behind a snowbank? <laughs> <laughs> it's a cost list. Just follow um, the green signs, John. <laughs> oh. It always says zero. Um, so I'm the port's. Uh, New person on on this uh, on this part of the board. I, I've been sitting on the policy board for the last five or six years. Tony Vassell retired uh, a month ago, so I've I've learned probably a little more acronyms than I have in the last five years, just in the last two hours. So um, I don't know what Tony told everybody in December, but I'll give a quick recap of the last twelve months. Um, the, the port finished up last year. Um, positive in pretty much every category um, from what we're taking into what's going out to uh, labor hours on the wharfs. Um, we were up up two or three ships. We were up on tonnage. Um, our projects that uh, I know several of you were on the come to policy board meetings, but everybody knows our biggest project is the the repurposing of the 80 acres that we purchased a few years ago in the town of Bethlehem. Um, we are planning on, on building the country's first um, wind tower manufacturing plant. We are hoping to finish the secret process in the town of Bethlehem um, over the next month. And we have, we're pretty much in every board meeting between the, the zoning board and the planning board, but, in February and March. Uh, we actually had one last night. Um, we are moving very quickly. It's a very tight schedule. Um, we're not getting as much help from a lot of our state agency partners as we would like or would expect. Um, we do get plenty of help out of state DOT. We got a nice report from state DOT, uh, our guys that we work with there to the town uh, just last week. So the town was very happy to get that and green light exactly where we've been putting in new roads, new infrastructure, maybe some new um, turning lanes and uh, possibly a new traffic signal at, um, 
uh, on uh, River Road and uh, South Pearl Street, just coming out of the city. Um, as part of that entire project, we're going to be repurposing about 14 acres within the current port district for another building that's the receiving yard and uh, entry point for this whole new wind operation that we're going to be siting. Um, that site application was put to the city of Albany about two months ago. Um, they received it very positively. We expect that process in the city at least to go very quickly. Um, once that's, once both of those are green lighted, um, road reconstruction will follow. Um, anybody that's been down to the port, uh, it's not a pleasurable experience, which is one of the reasons why this uh, committee reclassified port roads. Uh, I think we asked for that about three years ago. So we're hoping that we can get on uh, certain schedules for support. Um, because we're aiming to take trucks off of local Albany roads and Bethlehem roads and transferring some of them into the port. Um, some reports say we want to take all the trucks. That's simply impossible because of the curves and the multiple train crossings that are in the port, but we are looking to help Bethlehem and the city get some trucks off the road. Um, so we've got a lot going on and I'll probably have a more succinct report and uh, the next month that we meet. Uh, thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Thank Welcome. You. I'll be there in, per in person next time, Sandy. No problem. Very good. Thank you. Any questions on Port Authority initiatives? Hearing none. Our next meeting is February 16th, Sandy. And uh, we hope. <laughs> Check your email. <laughs> All right. And thank you for your support once again. Motion to adjourn. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe. Thank you.